Hello, everybody. Good morning and welcome to Connections. Praise God for another day and another opportunity for you and I to gather around the good word of God. We are blessed with Faithful Abraham. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Sunday's edition. Welcome to part two in our brand new series, Grace for the Race. Man, we are so glad you came along. Hallelujah. Let me say hello to those of you that are watching us on YouTube this morning. God bless you. Thank you. You know the drill by now. <laughs> like, subscribe, click that bell. Thank you so very much. Please let us know who you are, where you're watching from. That would be a blessing to us. Help us out as we're believing God for a uh, certain amount of partners. We're believing God for 200 partners and 100 views a day. And so that would be a blessing and encouragement to know who you are and where you're watching from. We have people from Africa, Singapore, and about 11, 12, 13 states uh, here in the United States, and we're thankful for all that. We're uh, excited about what God is doing. I believe the spirit of increase is on this ministry, and for our partners, increase is on their, their life and ministry. Uh, Rick Henson, him and his wife, I'm telling you what, God has just blessed their, their business, and they're just running and running, trying to catch up with all that God's doing in their life. They are definitely, uh, the spirit of increase is on them, and we're excited and thankful for them. And uh, so what love for you to think about becoming a partner with this ministry. Hallelujah. We are involved in this series, Grace for the Race, Part 2, but we usually read Psalm 91 first on Sundays. We want to do that this morning. So if you have your Bibles, let's open them, please, to Psalm 91. We'll read that, then we'll pray, we'll release our faith and believe God for utterance as we get in this uh, second message here. Uh, it, on my side, the screen looks really clear. If it's fuzzy, I apologize. We're going to try and work on that this afternoon. We went for a long stretch there with a good, clear signal. And uh, so I've made some phone calls this week, and we're going to do some other things this afternoon. Uh, Brother Krishna and I are going to get together and do some brainstorming and talk to some folks and see what we can do. But let me just remind you, faith comes by hearing, not by seeing. If the uh, fuzziness bothers you, just look away, but just listen to the message. Praise God and follow along in the word with us. Psalm 91. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful. God gave us this psalm a few years back, and we endeavor to read it every Sunday morning. Believe God for, for every benefit in here. Are you ready? Let's read. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Glory be to God. Father, we thank you for this psalm. We receive it for ourselves, our family, our church family. Father, every benefit of this psalm, we take it unto ourselves. We declare of you that you are our refuge and our fortress. And we declare that we live in this secret place of the Most High. So, Father, we give you praise and thanks for this psalm. And we take it as ours in Jesus' name. Father, as we approach your word this morning and be begin to minister on grace for the race, part two, we're asking for utterance, for wisdom, for revelation, for anointing. And we just believe we receive those things and we give you glory and honor in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. 
Let's open up our Bibles today to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Sister Gloria says, morning, Pastor. That's one of my favorite Psalms. Amen, sister. Yes, ma'am. Good to have you with us today, Sister Gloria. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. Going to get a little drink of water here. Praise the Lord. Hope you all had a great week and uh, we were blessed, had a good week, ready for a new one. Uh, for us, this officially kicks off a new week on Sundays for us with church, seeing church family, ministering. Hallelujah. Uh, ministered seven, uh, ministered 10 times this past week. Uh, I really enjoyed Saturday. <laughs> Lee and I just went shopping for a little bit and just kind of relaxed around the house, watched a movie, and then uh, she got busy getting things ready for for today and and uh, I took yesterday morning to get ready for today but we had about oh about eight hours I guess uh, to relax but uh, it was good to relax spend some time watching the movie with her and then we got busy again so we're thankful for that but we are ready to go ready for a new day and a new week excited about what God has for us this week you know faith expect it faith always is expecting manifestation because faith is now here we go. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. Paul says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was, was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Paul found the grace to run his race. And I believe you and I can do the same. We cannot find the grace to, to run somebody else's race, but we can find the grace to run our race. Paul did it, we can too. And his achievements, and there was quite a few of them, uh, he, he credited solely to the grace of God. He never said, yeah, you know, I prayed a lot. I fasted a lot. Uh, you know, I'm just really smart. And uh, God really uh, was blessed to pick me. <laughs> He didn't have any kind of thoughts like that. He gave all of the credit to the grace of God. And uh, we would be wise to do the same, right? It's his grace. It's his His love and his mercy that he picked us. He chose us and, and uh, he wants us and he has an everlasting love for us. But everything that's been accomplished in our life, it is a combination of the grace of God and the faith of God, the faith of God in that grace. And the faith, of course, comes from him as well as the grace. So Paul found grace for his race and all of his accolades. He said, you know what? All these achievements, it, it's really not me. It's the grace of God that he gave me. We're going to read in Matthew twenty-two fourteen. 14. Matthew twenty-two fourteen, 14. And Paul uh, gives us a good example there of, of crediting the grace of God, not taking any credit for himself. And if you read through the Gospels carefully and study the life of Jesus, you'll discover that Jesus never took credit for any sermon. Uh, he didn't say, yeah, I'm just really a good preacher. Uh, he didn't take any credit for any miracles or any healings. He always said, it's the Father within me. He's the one doing this. It's the Spirit of the Lord upon me. He's anointed me. So Jesus never took the credit. And if anybody could take the credit, it, I would think it would be Jesus, but he never did. He just solely submitted himself to the Father and the Holy Spirit and gave the credit. He never took the credit to himself. So like Jesus, like the Apostle Paul, we would do well to not take any credit, but just go ahead and give it to where it belongs. When people give me a compliment, I know where they're coming from. I do the same. But what I say, thank you. I receive it. And then I say, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I'll say something like that. So I receive it. But then I turn right around and give it to where it really belongs. So grace is awesome. Good morning, Sister Lisa. Good to have you with us today. Matthew 22 and 14. Once again, for those of you that are logging on, if the, the picture is fuzzy today, I apologize. We're going to endeavor to get that fixed here. We're going to do some things this afternoon. So if that bothers you, just look away. Remember, faith comes by hearing, not by seeing. <laughs> Matthew 22 and 14. Jesus said, for many are called, but few are are chosen. That verse has uh, been meaningful to me since I was a teen, uh, probably a preteen if I think back hard enough. Uh, I read the book of Matthew quite a bit when I was a, a preteen and, and teen for some reason. 
Let's put a ribbon marker there in Matthew 22, 14. We'll come back to it later on. Jesus said, for many are called, but few are chosen. Now, that's, that's an interesting statement. Uh, there's not a lot of words to that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight words. But the depth of this verse is absolutely amazing. Many are called, but few are chosen. If you look at the screen, you'll see Grace for the Race Part 2 and the title of the message, From Calling to Chosen. We don't want to just be, be called. We want to be chosen. We want to make that transfer <laughs> from called to chosen. Not everyone that is called becomes chosen. And we're going to look at a few of the reasons why that's true today. But let me give you one right now. Uh, not everybody responds. Not everybody that is called responds to the call. So they don't even begin to qualify for being chosen because they reject the call. And I have met uh, several people in my life that said, you know, years ago, I thought about going in the ministry. I had inclinations to do that, this or that. And, and you hear a note of regret in their voice. Uh, many people do not respond to the call, so they don't even get close to be, being chosen. So when Jesus said many are called, but few are chosen, that's not on God's part. That's on the people's part. When God calls, he calls, but then it's up to us to respond and say, you know what, I accept this, I'm gonna run with this, or no, I've got my own plans, or I can't do that, that's too much. God, you got the wrong person and start throwing up a lot of excuses. If God is greater, smarter, and more powerful than we are, and he is by a, a large degree, if he called you, he knows what he's doing. He thought that out before he ever uh, tapped on your shoulder. God called you and you want to receive, you want to accept that call, but then you want to go from called to chosen. We're gonna to go to 1 Thessalonians, please. We'll read 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. For several decades of my life, <clears throat> from uh, <clears throat> teen, 20s, 30s, 40s, I was just, the word for my life was called. I talked a lot about the call. I, uh, I, I taught and preached on the call. And uh, I rejoiced that God had called me, you know, that I was called into the ministry. And we'll, we'll get into that here in a little bit. But there's been a shift since I came to Colorado uh, and the word chosen is, is really beginning to stand out at me now. And I'm thankful for that. But the word called still means a lot to me. There's a lot in that word. First Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24, the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. We must have faith in his faithfulness. I don't know if you ever thought of that. That's interesting. I want you to think about that for a moment. We must have faith in his faithfulness. God is faithful and he is very faithful about the call. If God has called you, he also will do it. If you will just say, yes, Lord, I accept the call, whatever he's calling you to do, if you accept it, he will bring it to pass. We need to put our faith, not so much in our ability, but in his faithfulness. We need to put our faith in his grace. You can count on him, uh, you can count on him leading you. You can count on him guiding you. He will, he will direct your footsteps. He will lead you. He will guide you. He will speak to you. He will reveal the word to you. He will give you wisdom. God does not call us and then say, okay, figure it out on your own. And when you get to heaven, we'll kind of sort it all out. No, God does not expect us to live this life on our own ability he wants to live on the inside of us and live his life through us. Amen. He's the vine. We're the branch. The life of the vine flows through the branch, and we're called to bear fruit. Well, that comes as we rest in him and that let his life flow through us. 
So you can count on him. You can count on him to bring the, these things to pass. If you are fearful about not finding your place, it's because you lack faith in his faithfulness. Now, to me, that is the, that's the heart of the issue right there. If you are stressed out, if you're worried, if you're full of anxiety and you're full of fear about finding your place and running your race, I'm telling you, it's because you lack faith in his faithfulness. If he called you, then he will bring it to pass. He is just looking for your cooperation and he's looking for some faith on your part. But he's not expecting you to, to do all this on your own. Amen. You know what? <laughs> God has called you and I to live and to do the impossible. And if you'll stop and think about that, that will give you great encouragement. <laughs> it really will. God has called you and I to live and to do the impossible. Well, okay, great. Because we can't do it, but he can and he will through us. But God's never called you to do something that you can do. He's called you to do what you cannot do. And that's awesome. If you think about that, God has just taken the limits off. And he's just saying, I'm calling you to live an impossible life. I'm calling you to do the impossible, but I'm going to do it through you. Amen. That, that's just awesome. That's just awesome. Now, I want to make a statement here. Uh, and don't, um, don't be offended at this. Good morning. Um, hallelujah. Glory to God. The numbers are going up. Just want to say hi to everybody. So don't, don't be offended at this, but I'm telling you, God has called you to do the impossible, to live the impossible life. And, and he will do it through you. So God has called you to live a way that's so different from the world. <laughs> but how's that happen? Him living his life through you, the life of God manifesting in you, it's called grace. Amen. It's called grace. We're here in Thessalonians. Just go a few pages over with me to Hebrews, Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Just go to your right a little bit in your Bible. Hebrews 13, 20, 21. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work, <clears throat> excuse me, to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Isn't that powerful? Make you perfect, make you mature, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. He is faithful. He's faithful to those whom he's called, if they'll just accept the call. Now, <clears throat> grace for the race, running the race that God's called you to do, not running my race, me not running your race. Uh, our races may, may go coincide and we're running along looking at each other, talking and encouraging each other. But I don't have the grace for your race. You don't have the grace for mine, but we can encourage each other. The call is connected to desire. We're going to get into this this morning from calling to chosen. Let's look at the at being called for a moment. Then we'll look at how to go from called to chosen. And it's all grace, responding to that grace, and then just uh, identifying some of these markers. The call is connected to desire, to spiritual desire, to, to desire of the heart. Your spiritual desire will help you define who you are, and it will help guide you. Let me say that again. Your spiritual desire will help define who you are and will help guide you. I have no desire to be a worship leader. I've said that before. I have no desire to be a worship leader. I have no desire to be an evangelist. I have no desire to be a prophet. That was those areas... Do not interest me. That's not where my heart's desires lie. God, When God calls you, he will put in your heart the desire to do. The Bible says in Philippians that God works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. God's not going to call you to do one thing, but then put a desire in your heart to do something else. God's smarter than that. So we need to just 
look at our heart's desire. What is the spiritual desires of our heart? That is what God's called you to do. Now, when I teach on some of these things, one of the things that God gave me years ago, and this is one of those questions that are up there real high that people ask you as a pastor, about how can I tell when it's God's desire or when it's just me desiring it? Well, one of the ways you can tell is this. The desires of the spirit are consistent. The desires of the flesh are erratic. Your flesh will want to do one thing one day. It'll want to do something else the next week. And by the end of the month, you'll, your flesh wants to do three or four other things. So the flesh's desire is real erratic. It's not consistent. It's not constant. But the desire of your spirit, of your heart that God placed in there will always be there. It'll be constant. It'll be consistent. It'll be about the same thing year after year after year. You will desire what God has called you to do. That already is the beginnings of grace working in you. And so you may have to pray a little bit. You may have to fast a little bit. You may have to spend some time meditating and fellowshipping, and praising the Lord to sift through some of your thoughts and emotions. But I'm telling you, your most consistent spiritual desire is what God has called you to do. So your spiritual desire will help define who you are and, and will help guide you. Now, there are times that I, I reference me because I don't know you. <laughs> I don't know your life. I know mine. And I know that, uh, I, as you know, just growing up, uh, I'd, I'd wake up in the middle of the night with tears running down my face because I had a dream about preaching or teaching. I've always, my, my heart's desire has always been to have an open Bible and standing before people, teaching people, preaching to people God's word. That has been the, the overall uh, desire of my heart other than having a covenant relationship with him. You know, I, I've dreamt about this. I can just meditate and I'll start to cry about it. The, the, the prophet said, it's like a fire shut up in my bones. So that will help you, that fire shut up in your bones will help to help you to discern the grace God has given you for your race, what he's called you to do. Uh, when, I was, um, when I was a kid growing up, I would sit on the front row of the, the church on the pew there, and I'd just watch my pastor. I mean, I, was, I had him in my sights. No matter what he, where he went or what he did, I was watching him. I was learning from him because uh, that was my heart's desire. I want to be a pastor. I want to be a preacher and a teacher. And so um, you will discover your most consistent desires is God's grace working in you. That's what he's calling you to do. Hallelujah. Your spiritual desire, and I'm going to say this again. Somebody's taking notes. Somebody's struggling right now. Your spiritual desire will help define who you are and, and will help guide you. God is working in you right now today. God's working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. When you get a response in your heart, and you begin to see something that, that matches your calling and matches your grace, it will excite you. And that is the thing to follow. I'm not trying to be repetitive, but I just sense right now in my spirit, there are people struggling. When you get a response, you, you're hearing a message, or somebody's talking, you're reading a book. When you get a response in your heart and you begin to see something that matches your calling and your grace, it will excite you, and that is the thing to follow. God's grace, his call, excites you. God's not going to grace you to do something, and you're like, ho-hum, well, all right. No, you're excited about it. Uh, you know, last week I, I ministered 10 times. Uh, I'm excited. I'm excited about being here this morning. I'm excited about this week of broadcast. I can't wait to get up and get after it. Uh, we're about our 600th uh, broadcast. I'm still excited. I'm, my excitement's growing. Why? It's grace. God works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. God graces us. And the first uh, deposits of grace is a desire to do what he's called you to do. And it excites your heart. And it is a consistent desire through thick and thin, through test trials of life, the temptations of the enemy and of the flesh, your most consistent desire of your heart. That's grace working in you. That's God guiding you into his plan for your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you know what? <clears throat> 
If a goose can follow the direction of the Lord, Philip can follow the direction of the Lord. If a goose can follow the direction of the Lord, Sister Lisa can follow the direction of the Lord. If a goose can follow the direction of the Lord, Sister Gloria can follow the direction of the Lord. Amen. It, it, no matter who's watching today, I'm telling you, if a goose can follow the direction of the Lord, you're smarter than a goose. All right. You can follow the direction of the Lord. He's faithful. He's faithful. You will know it. And he's faithful. You will see it. You will know it. You will see it on the inside. Then you'll know it and you'll see it and you'll do it on the outside because he's faithful to work in you, to will and to do of his good pleasure. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12. We'll, we'll read over there. 1 Corinthians 12. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 18, please. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 18. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 12, 12 through 18. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I'm not of the hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body, is therefore is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. God knows what's going to make your life happy. He knows what's going to make your life satisfied. He knows what's going to just give you that ah, satisfaction, that that aha moment, that aha life where other, other people are, are struggling and striving for it. God knows what's going to make you the happiest, the most rich, the most satisfied. And he has placed you in the body as it had pleased him. He, and he has graced you for that place. You are a specific member of the body put in a specific place to do a specific job. But wanting to be and do another part is a big problem in the church. There is no place to operate in the body on the earth where there is no challenges, there's no temptations, and there's no issues. No one has a call, has a position in the body of Christ where there's no challenges, there's no temptations, there's no problems. All right, not in this life, not here on the earth, because we got the devil, the cursed, crazy people, our stinking flesh. We are going to have some challenges. No matter what your position is in the body, you're going to have some challenges. You're going to have some temptations and tests and trials. So there's no place to operate in the body of Christ here on the earth without those. How can you find your place and develop your grace? There is two parts to this. There are two parts to you finding your place and you finding your grace. Two parts. The first part is God's part. That's good to know. <laughs> That's good to know. The first part is God's part. He called you. He graced you. He set you in the body, and he is faithful. His part is foreknowledge and faithfulness. Let me say that again. God's part is foreknowledge and faithfulness. That's the first part. The second part is our part. <clears throat> our part is faith and faithfulness. God is faithful, but are we? <laughs> faith is such a big part of this, and faithfulness is such a big part. Everybody <clears throat> is just as called as the next, all right? It may not be a speaking part, but every Christian has a call in their life. There, there's no one that is only uh, supposed to be a Christian. Well, I, I'm called to be a Christian, and that's it. No, no. just as God has designed, there's no unused parts in our physical body. There are to be no unused parts in the body of Christ. Every part 
is to be functioning. Uh, if, if a part of your body stopped working, would you know it? <laughs> yes, you would. Well, Jesus is very aware of his body, the church, and he knows those parts that aren't working. They're not in their place. They're not running their race. They're not operating in grace. And Jesus is highly aware of those parts that are functioning and those that are not. And God the Father has chosen for every born-again Christian to have a part, a functioning part. No one is just called to be a Christian. Now, faith is a big part of this. Faithfulness is a big part of this. There are some places, there are some, some places that we're called to that may take a little bit more training than others, but don't get discouraged. Just don't compare yourself with other people don't get discouraged and say, well, this is taking too long. God may have a place for you in the body and he's getting you ready and it's going to take a little bit longer. So just stay with it. Just stay in faith and stay in faithfulness. God is faithful. His faithfulness and his grace is going to get you to where he wants you to be and he's going to help you to operate what he wants you to operate in. God truly has grace for your race, but you're going to have to trust him on it. Amen. Amen. Let's go to Matthew. Again, let's go back to Matthew 22. We put a little ribbon marker there. Matthew 22, 14. Jesus said, for many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, few are chosen. I want to just check out a scripture here real quick. <clears throat> I think it's in Psalm 47. Give me just a moment. Had this thought. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for giving me that, that scripture. Psalm 42, please. Psalm 42. Psalm 42 and 7. <clears throat> so in Matthew, Jesus says, Many are called, few are chosen. In Psalm 42, 7, deep calleth unto deep <clears throat> at the noise of thy water spouts all thy waves and thy billows are gone over me deep calleth unto deep deep calls unto deep the call and the desire help you to identify your place man i hope you're getting this the call and the desire help you to identify your place Look at those things that appeal to you. Look at those things that cause you to raise an eyebrow and go, hmm, that's interesting. I can see myself doing that. Really? Look at that. Follow that. Check that out. Not everybody is called to do that. One thing calls to another. You may be called to be in the ministry of helps, somebody else, that's not, that doesn't appeal to them. That's not calling to them. What's calling them is, is what we call the fivefold ministry. Maybe their calling is to be uh, an evangelist. You have no desire to be an evangelist, but man, I can see myself running a camera. I can see myself duplicating CDs. I can see myself working in the church bookstore. I can see myself doing the books for the church. What is it that appeals to you? One thing calls to another, and deep calls to deep. Now, not everybody that is called is going to be chosen. Most of the ones called don't wind up chosen. Only a few of the many that are called are chosen. And this will help you, because we want to go from being called to being chosen. We want both of these. We want to receive the grace for our race. We want to know what we're called to do. We want to be faithful to do it. We want to be found faithful day in and day out, decade in, decade out. We want to stay faithful with our call. But our ultimate heart's desire should be go from being called to being chosen. I believe that this is going to help you. You can help identify what, what you are and your graces by taking notice of these two things. And these two things will help us to go from called to chosen. Two things to notice. Number one, locations. Locations. 
where you have been and where you are going. Where you have been and where you are going. Locations. Let me just come over here real quick and just. Uh, oh, it's Brother William. Good morning. Praise God. I was snow blowing our sidewalk. <laughs> oh, they got four inches. And the Lord put something on me. Yes, I follow through. And then I heard your teaching when I came inside to watch. This was an amazing feeling in my heart. I'm telling you, God is grace. Thank you, Brother William. There is grace. That was perfect timing. Thank you, Father, for illustrating grace right there. Grace is so very practical. Two things to notice to help us locate what our, our, our calling, what our grace is. One, locations. Locations. Where have you been and where are you going? And number two, associations. When you look at your locations, when you look at your associations, it will help you to discern your grace. It will help you discern what your calling is. Associations. Who have you been around and who are you around now? Once again, I, I can't talk about you because I don't know you. I can only talk about me. Ever since I was a little kid, I was hanging around preachers. I mean, I'm talking 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. Uh, I'd see a, a group of three or four preachers standing around talking. I'm going to go get in the conversation. I spent my time with pastors and preachers and because that's what I was going to be when I grew up. And so I spend my time with those in the ministry. Who are you associating with? Who have you been around? Who are you around now? Who are you drawn to? Here's something else. Be alert to discontentment. Discontentment can help you, can help alert you that there's something else. Oh man, this is so important. Lord, help me to bring this out the right way. A holy dissatisfaction, a, a holy discontentment. Maybe you look around and the bills are paid and you know, you live in a comfortable place and, you know, you and the missus or the mister are not fighting too bad. And, you know, overall things are good and you should be happy. But on the inside, there's a dissatisfaction. What's going on? Deep is calling unto deep. There's a deeper place. God has more for you and it's calling you. Hallelujah. So be alert to discontentment. Discontentment can help alert you that there's something else. If you are constantly thinking that there's got to be more than this, guess what? There's got to be more than this. <laughs> God has something else for you. God, you know, don't be satisfied with where you're at. Be, be thankful, but seek. That's a word for somebody. Stop being satisfied. In fact, you're not satisfied. Be thankful for what God has done. Be thankful for where he's brought you. You need to be thankful, but seek him because there's a, there's a discontentment. There's an unrest. There's a dissatisfaction on the inside of you. And that's God's, that is God saying, son, daughter, I've got more for you than this. And so be thankful, but seek him. Be alert to discontentment. I know uh, now, you know, time goes by so fast. I went three, four years ago. I was just so unhappy. I was like washing my feet with my socks on. God, what is it? I'm missing something. I'm missing something. What is it? But what I was missing was right here, was, was doing seven times a week of a daily broadcast or six times a week. And then Wednesday night, I, I wasn't doing this. I wasn't reaching the world like I was supposed to. I wasn't on YouTube and, and Facebook. I wasn't on the internet. One, once I started doing this, that that feeling of having washing my feet with my socks on was gone. That, that I went from a dissatisfaction to a, ah, uh, yeah, this is it. This is it. Now, I'm sure in another two or three years, I'll start feeling dissatisfied again. <laughs> Why? Because deep calls into deep. God's always calling us to a greater place in him. And a greater place means greater, a greater grace and it means greater faith. Praise God, man. Hallelujah. This is just awesome. This is awesome stuff. Not because I'm teaching it, it's just awesome truth. Hallelujah. God is not satisfied with you staying where you're at. 
he's not happy. You know, discontentment is you sensing that God's not happy with where you are. And I say this a lot. God has a, a schedule, for, a, a, a plan for your life. And everybody talks about, talks about how God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for your life. He also has a schedule for your life. He wants you at a certain place at a certain time. And so we'll rejoice when you get to that spot that he has you, has you in for that season. And man, you're happy. God's happy. <clears throat> but after a while, after four or five years, God's going to say, you know what? Uh, it's time to move on. If you're going to fulfill my plan for your life, I, we've got a schedule to keep. And so he's going to put in you a, a discontentment. You're dissatisfied. Nothing can make you happy anymore. God is saying it's time to move. I got greater grace for you. Deep calls unto deep. Many are called, few are cho chosen. Do you know why few are chosen? Not many follow. Very few follow. This is one of the biggest reasons why that the majority of people do not go from being called to being chosen is they simply will not follow. They'll follow God to a certain point, so to a certain place in life and ministry. And then as far as they're concerned, they're done. And God's like, no, 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 we've got a schedule to keep. I want you over here. And people will just override. And then there'll be a sourpuss. They'll be hard to get along with. And uh, that's the one person at church you really don't want to get around because they're always in a negative attitude and they got a negative uh, uh, mood about them and they're just nin, 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 all the time. They should have been gone from there a long time ago, but they're going to just stay there. And so they never go from being called to being chosen because in order for you and I to go from being called to being chosen, we're going to have to follow. We're going to have to follow the Lord. He has grace for your race. But you're going to have to respond and say, yes, you're going to have to have some faith and faithfulness and you're going to have to follow the Lord. You're going to have to follow the Lord. Amen. Read with me, please, in Matthew chapter four. Matthew chapter four. <clears throat> Matthew chapter four. Verse 19. Matthew 4, 19, I, the plan of God unfolds. It is extremely rare for God to give somebody up front. This is what I have for you ultimately. Very, very, he does that on occasion, but that's rare that God will tell somebody up front, this is what I have for you. Most of the time, it's an unfolding. We have to walk by faith. We have to be faithful. We have to just stay obedient to the Lord and do what he's told us to do. And the plan of God unfolds uh, more and more. In, in Matthew 4, 19, and he saith unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You are never going to find out what God has for you until your heart is absolutely open and willing to do anything he tells you to do. The least bit of unwillingness will be a blockage between you and him. The plan of God is not complicated. It comes down to, will you follow him? Will you follow him? I'm at the time of this recording, I'm 61 years of age. And I look over my life and I am amazed at how God has led me to the different states to pastor the different churches, each one a miracle on, on how to get there. Uh, it cost me 50 cents to move my family from Illinois to Wisconsin to pastor a little bitty church up in Black River Falls, Wisconsin in 1985 and 86. You know, and then from there to Arkansas, back to Illinois, then to Colorado, I mean, every time God opened up a door for me to pastor, it wasn't through a denomination. Uh, and God told me years ago to stay out of that denominational pipeline, that he was going to do things in my life, and he's been faithful to do it. But I look back at the faithfulness of God, and the plan of God continues to unfold. Now, as we get close to closing here, I'm, I'm supposed to share this with you. I didn't know I was going to share this, but, but I need to share this with you because you... you 
I want to help you to understand how God works. And not that I know it all because I'm still learning myself. But I find this interesting. The Bible says in Philippians that God works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. When I was living in Illinois and pastoring in Illinois, I had no, I had no thought, I had no idea that I would ever move to Colorado and pastor here. I had no, never even entered my mind. I had a desire one day to get a magazine. I was at the store and I found this magazine and it was called Art of the West. And I looked at it and I liked it, so I bought it. So I looked at the paintings and read a couple articles. Next month, I went to the store, bought another one. Well, I wound up getting a, a, a subscription and uh, had about, I don't know, two, three years of subscribing to Art of the West. So I'm there <laughs> looking, you know, just in my, in my easy chair, just looking at the magazine, just turning the pages. And I just begin to think to myself, what would it be like to live out west? I, I had never lived west of the Mississippi my entire life. Man, what's it like to be where there's mountains? What's it like to be out there? Huh, maybe I can go out there one day for a vacation. Wouldn't it be neat to go out there one day for a vacation? I sure would like to see the mountains. Hallelujah. What was God doing? He was putting seeds of desire in my heart. At the time, I didn't know that. I didn't know that until after a couple of years I got here and I, I gave away all those magazines because I don't, I don't use them anymore. Don't, don't look at them. And it, I, was, I was like, hey, God used this to put a seed in my heart, put a desire in my heart to move to Colorado. Now, uh, my family and I, we came out to Pueblo, Colorado. Oh, this was a long, long time ago. My sister lived out here at the time. We came out here for a, a three-day uh, vacation and then went, flew back home to Illinois. And so my sister, we got, got in the car. My sister drove me up in the mountains. I cried and I cried and I cried and I cried. Uh, probably, no, no exaggeration, probably for an hour, hour and a half, I just kept weeping as, as my, my sister drove us through the mountains. What was going on? I, I couldn't tell you at the time. But my spirit man was reacting, was responding, this is home. This is home. This is where you're going to be one day. Wow. In fact, I drove down the street that we're living now. I drove down the street not knowing that Leanne was here. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Um, so I'm, I'm got all this emotion going on. I'm, my, my wife says, my kids say, my sister, what, what are you crying about? I don't know. I don't know, but I'm just, there's this churning going on. I'm weeping. We go back home. I thought, well, that was crazy. Didn't think about it for years. And then I get the magazine, watch, look at the magazine for about three years. And God's putting a desire in my heart. And then one day Jesus appears to me and says, move to Pueblo, Colorado. God works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. Many times we don't recognize the small seeds of grace those God's just fashioning our heart. He's working on our desires. He's he's massaging into our heart those things that are that he's working in, working in us. That's of his good pleasure. That's pleasing in his sight. And many times we don't recognize it. We just don't recognize the seeds of grace that is going to grow in our life. And we need to be. And so I'm going to encourage you today to go from being called to being chosen. How faith, faithfulness. Look for that discontentment, amen, and follow. Follow God every day, every day. Just be thankful for where you are, but seek him because God has more grace. He's got a greater place for you. He's got, he's got better friends for you. Nothing against the friends you have now. He's got better friends. He's got fresh money for you. He's got a greater place for you with greater grace, but he needs you to follow him. He needs you to put your faith in his faithfulness. Know that he has a plan. He has a schedule for your life. And if you will follow him step by step, the plan of God will unfold. And you're going to say, you know what? I have grace to run my race. For this season, I have grace to do this. I'm not doing it on my own ability. I'm doing it by the grace of God. Amen. Hallelujah.
Guys, I just think this is so important. I really do. I said this last week. There's more bouncing around in the body of Christ than in a pinball machine. So many people are displaced. So many people are out of their place. We, we need to have the grace to run our race. Stop looking at others. Stop comparing yourself with other people. Just be happy with you and Jesus and let him work in you. You don't know all the places he has for you. You don't know all the places. You don't know all the graces he has for you. You don't know. You just don't know. He's got big plans for you, but it's going to require your faith and his faithfulness. Look for the discontentment. Know it's God working in you and follow him. And his wonderful plan for your life will unfold step by step, grace by grace. Amen. Father, I thank you for the people this morning. I give you praise for each and every one of them. Everybody that watches this broadcast, I pray your blessings upon them. Father, use these words to work in, in them, to will and to do of your good pleasure. And Father, I pray that no person that watches this, listens to this, will ever be content being discontented, but that they will strive to follow you. And I declare in Jesus' name that they will run their race by your grace. Father, I thank you that you have more grace for them than what they, they're aware of, but I thank you for giving them a fresh encounter with your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for being with me today. Appreciate it. Once again, sorry for the fuzziness. We're going to work on that today and get that taken care of. Praise God, no matter how long it takes, but hopefully we can get it done today. Once again, faith doesn't come by seeing, it comes by hearing. <laughs> Hallelujah. Speaking of hearing, we'll see everybody tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. as we continue our series on the authority of the believer. I was looking at our notes. We'll probably go another three, four weeks on the authority of the believer. God's got some good things to say for us uh, and to us in this area. So we'll see everybody tomorrow morning at 8 a.m.